All right, good morning, everyone. How's everyone doing? Good, good. Everyone have a nice, uh, nice long constitutional free weekend? I, I thank you. Yeah. I thank you all for your patience uh, with the class on Thursday. I think just about all of you here, hope you all enjoyed it. Um, if you want to watch again, the video's online. If you didn't make it, uh, the, the the session on Friday, three people showed up, so we had a nice discussion, but we did it anyway. Uh, so there's not much not much there, but if you were there, it was a good discussion. Uh, let's see. All right. We do have some questions. So I have no knowledge about Leo DiCaprio winning an Oscar. I have no... I couldn't care less about that. The only thing I... The only thing I know is like, did anyone see the movie Twelve Years a Slave? Did anyone watch that movie? Only two people. Twelve Years a Slave, a movie. It won like Best Picture, right? So that movie was about the Constitution, right? So it actually involved the Fugitive Slave Club. There was a guy, was a solemn Northrop. He was uh, uh, captured in, I think it was in upstate New York. He was, oh no, he was a, he was traveling in like I think in Maryland somewhere, uh, and then he was brought to, was it Georgia or South Carolina? I can't remember, somewhere in the South, and he's basically in prison. They took his identity and said, you are now a slave. And he spent 12 years as a freeman trying to uh, win, his, win his freedom back. Um, and that's directly because of the Fugitive Slave Clause. So you might recall that under our Constitution, the northern states were required to help bring back slaves to justice to the South. And the southern states would not listen to any northern request to bring people to the north. So this was a direct problem of the Constitution. The second problem, which you're probably not going to be much aware of, is the slave trade ended in 1825, right? That's when it was prohibited, okay? They needed more slaves. So where did they get more slaves from? They basically, uh, the slaveholders captured free blacks in the north and brought them to the south. So actually one of the direct byproducts of the slave trade from Africa was they had to start basically repopulating by capturing northern freedmen, uh, which is a perfect segue to our topic for today, which is the Reconstruction Amendments. But let's mention other questions. Uh, Okay, the Ario case. This one's actually interesting. So, uh, uh, Ario is actually this cool thing which allows you to watch broadcast TV over your computer. So, Ario has thousands of little antennas, and each antenna is dedicated to one person. So, you can basically rent one of those antennas in the air and stream all the TV to your personal device, your tablet. So, that's the case for the Supreme Court. Uh, the budget reconciliation process, ask about it later. It's a mess. If you're confused about it, don't worry about it. It's not, doesn't make sense. Uh, Holt v. Hobbs. This is a case actually very impressive. Supreme Court granted certiorari about three hours ago, this morning. Um, and this case involves a Muslim man in a prison who was forced to shave his beard. And the question is whether it violates religious liberties of a prisoner to force him to shave his beard against his convictions. Um, there are certain hygiene and safety reasons why prisoners can't have beards because they can hide stuff in them that's perhaps legitimate, but there's also things that people want to have beards. This is an ongoing issue. Supreme Court will take this issue up. Okay. And what, any other questions? What else is on your mind? What else are you thinking about? Yeah? This doesn't concern Kwan Law, but uh, how do you hide something in a beard? <laughs> <laughs> Very easily. If you have a big beard, you just shove it in there and you can't see it. Actually, it's very easy. Anyone have a big, anyone ever have like a long beard? Can you hide stuff in there? I mean, in, in prison, a shiv, right? A shiv can be this big. It's basically like a sharp piece of metal, and you can hide in your beard. And a prison guard might not see it. I mean, it's actually it's actually very easy to hide something in a beard. Okay. Other questions. Actually, it's funny because of the hipster trend of people having so much facial hair. Gillette's actually taking a loss in profits. People aren't buying razor and shaving cream as much. I swear to God, Gillette's actually had to take a hit in their earnings of hipsterism because people are having these long beards. What's up? <laughs> Can't follow that one, can you? <laughs> But um, on Thursday, we were talking, or whenever, Wednesday, we were talking about issues of like taxation and how uh, the social, the, the child labor case was never officially overturned. Nope. But how is it that the social security cases didn't overturn the child labor cases? Because they, the social security said exactly what child labor, the opposite of what child labor is. Ask me after class. I'll get to that. All right, other questions? All right, so today, We'll be talking about um, the Reconstruction Amendments. Okay, we're done with federal powers for now, but let's be precise. We're only done with federal powers in the Article One, Section Eight. There are other grants to Congress of federal power. In particular, each of the Reconstruction Amendments, Thirteenth, Fourteenth, and Fifteenth, gives Congress powers. So before I begin, uh, everyone should vote tomorrow, right? And if you weren't going to vote, 
especially the ladies, after you read the minor case, you should go vote tomorrow. This is something that you should not pass up. It's too damn important. Okay? Everyone should vote. People work way too hard to fight for this. People just sit at home. All right. So let's talk about the Reconstruction Amendments. So you will recall that during the Civil War, President Lincoln issued the Emancipation Proclamation. Okay? This was, we discussed, his war power. Part of his war power was that he basically said all slaves in the rebel states were now emancipated. But let's look very closely at what he did. Lincoln did not free the slaves in the North. Why? Because the North, Northern states were in a rebellion. His war power only extended to the Southern states in rebellion. But more so, how is it that Lincoln was able to free the slaves? Did he issue some broad pronouncement of civil rights that these people are now citizens? No. He effectively confiscated the property of the Southerners. And you have to keep that in mind because it is very relevant to the 13th Amendment. At the time, under the Dred Scott opinion, which we'll say later, Africans, free African slaves, were considered property. Okay? What Lincoln said in the Emancipation Proclamation is, I, as commander-in-chief, am seizing property in the South. The same way you could have seized a railroad or seize a, a cannon, he seized the slaves. And he says, I am basically going to relinquish the bond between the master and the slave. Okay? By severing that bond, which is effectively a property contract, he made them free blacks. Okay? Now, Lincoln did this under his war power, right? That wasn't an act of Congress, that wasn't a constitutional amendment. It's dubious if you could even do this. Some people think the Emancipation Proclamation was unconstitutional. It may have been. But what happens when the war's over and the war power ceases? Right? We say the war power is usually when there's some sort of conflict, the Civil War is over. Would the Emancipation Proclamation remain in effect? In other words, what if there were new slaves? Could the president then emancipate them under the, uh, his war power if the war is over? Okay. This precarious state led to the period known in our history as Reconstruction. After the Civil War was over, our nation was in shambles. It was a mess. The Union didn't really exist as we think it does. There were about you know, a dozen states in the South, which were formerly Confederate states, which had been in rebellion. And they were not admitted back into the Union right away. There were strict limitations put on them. Even more so, the Union Army effectively commanded each state. A member of the Union Army would basically be the general of a given state and would control everything. They took over their, their governments, they took over everything. You know, it's funny, when I first uh, went to Virginia to study for law school, I heard the phrase, the War of Northern Aggression. Has anyone ever heard that phrase before? And I kind of laughed at that, because as a, as a New Yorker, we, it, it's, it's, you don't even think about that phrase. But the essence of Reconstruction was that the uh, North said, we need to rebuild the South. We need to effectively gut out all of the provisions, all of the governments, everything, and make it a new, better government. Okay? So the very first step in that process was going to be the ratification of the 13th Amendment. Now, did anyone see the movie Lincoln a year or two ago? I actually, I didn't like it. I found it really boring. Uh, I, it was way too long, and I love the Constitution, and I love the Constitutional Amendments, but I found the movie boring as hell, so I was so disappointed. I really wanted to like it, and I didn't. Anyway. So the entire purpose of the movie Lincoln was to show how President Lincoln led the ratification of the 13th Amendment. Well, the movie was totally wrong. The entire movie focused on the House of Representatives, right? But there was also the Senate and then the states, right? That's how you have an amendment. It goes from the one house, three-fourths, another house, three-fourths, and then the states, right? They skipped the rest of that, but the, the entire movie focused on the, on the House of Representatives. The essence of the 13th Amendment was to eradicate the institution of slavery. And I'll go through the text in a few minutes. But what was most significant about the 13th Amendment is that for the first time, our Constitution acted on individuals. In the past, everything in the Constitution focused on the government. 
Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of speech. Con states can impair contracts. States can't pass ex post facto laws. No bills of attainder, right? Things the state can't do. But here, for the first time, this is the 13th Amendment, we have a provision of the Constitution that acts directly on individuals. The second one was actually prohibition. We got rid of that, thankfully. Okay? Right, you couldn't drink. It says, neither slavery nor involuntary servitude shall exist within the United States. That is a very powerful phrase. It's not saying the government can't have slaves. It's saying this institution cannot exist anywhere in the United States. You can't have it. Public, private, doesn't matter. Okay? This did what Lincoln wanted to do with the Emancipation Proclamation. This nullified every single slavery contract in the United States. All people who were bound by slavery, if you saw the movie, 12 Years a Slave, you'll actually see one of the first scenes where they, uh, they basically bring this guy to a, uh, a slave market, the same way you go to a butcher shop, and they say, I'll pay whatever dollars for that guy. And then they, they write a contract. They say, okay, for whatever dollars, you now own this person for labor for his entire life. This amendment nullified all those contracts. Gone. But even more significantly, is Section 2. This isn't just saying Congress, I'm sorry, this isn't just saying slavery is eliminated. No, 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 it's doing much more than that. It's saying Congress shall now have the power to enforce this through appropriate legislation. What does that mean? Congress's powers just got expanded. We're not just talking now about Article 1, Section 8, you know, commerce and coin money and post offices and that stuff, right? Now Congress has the power to pass laws to make sure that there's no slavery. And it's not just slavery. Involuntary servitude is a concept even broader than slavery. And we'll see why this is relevant soon. So with the 13th Amendment, Congress now has the power to prohibit this. And how did they do this? <laughs> they sent Union generals down to the South and they basically busted up any people holding slaves. They would arrest people for keeping slaves. They would go onto uh, plantations and free people, literally. When you think the 13th Amendment was ratified, you think all these southern plantation owners said, hey, go free my friends, my brothers and sisters, and go, go, go. No, 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 that, that, that didn't happen. Right? As a practical matter, you have to send union generals down to these plantations and go basically farm to farm freeing people. This... Section 2 gave Congress the power to send their people, right, send federal officers into states to do this. Now, I know it's difficult for us to think, how could this possibly be a bad thing? But just, just to play devil's advocate, this was a serious shift in the federal-state relationship, a serious shift. You know, we say that states are viewed as sovereigns and states are protectors of liberty. Well, in this case, the states do a very good job at that. In fact, they were, they were the tyrants, right? So in this sense, we used to say ambition must be checked. Ambition must be made to check ambition. In the other case we did last week, it was the states protecting liberty. But here, it's the federal government that protects liberty. Each government has a certain sphere of influence. And what the federal government is now charged with is protecting this inherent civil liberty that you can't be held as a slave. Right? So it's not just the states are protecting certain rights. The feds protect other rights. And this is you know, not a bad thing when these two forces are clashing. And, and in our, our system of laws, when you amend the Constitution, this is saying that now the feds have the power to ensure that states cannot allow slavery. Right, we're not relying on the Mississippi militia to, to de, you know, desegregate and uh, free the slaves. That, that, that wasn't going to happen. No, no offense to Mississippi, right? So this is such a significant amendment. But it didn't stop there, though. So immediately, oh, by the way, just a threshold matter, not all of the states, that's why I picked on Mississippi, not all of the states ratify the 13th Amendment. Do you know what Mississippi ratified the 13th Amendment? You don't want to guess? Like 1990 1995. 
Mississippi formally, I mean, it's Mississippi formally ratified the 13th Amendment in 1995. Kentucky did it in the 70s, I think. And Kentucky was actually in the Union. Yeah. Lincoln, Lincoln always said, I can, I can lose God, but I need Kentucky. He always, <laughs> he always said that about the Civil War. So, immediately after the 13th Amendment was ratified, the states in the South began erecting what were called the Black Codes. You might know it as Jim Crow. These were an entire institution created to recreate slavery without calling it such. And this was so far and wide-reaching, it's difficult to even grasp what was accomplished here. Every single aspect of what a free person would do was now limited severely. You know, when I teach property, I talk a lot about this. Blacks were not allowed to own property. They were not allowed to sell property. They were not allowed to obtain property. Right? Remember, we learned about the bundle of sticks, right? Their entire bundle was snapped in half. They had no bundle of sticks. And in fact, the only way the freedmen, by the way, they were called freedmen, because they were freed, right? The only way the freedmen could actually have land was if they worked on it. This is what we now know as sharecropping. So think about this. The only way a black person could cultivate land was if he lived on it. And who do you think the master was? Right? This recreated slavery indirectly. It said, you can only work on this land if you work for me. This was an indirect form of slavery. Okay? They couldn't pursue various callings. States passed laws saying that you couldn't become uh, a, a black person, couldn't become a butcher or a blacksmith or any profession. The only, the only profession that was usually allowed for them was agriculture, farming. Blacks couldn't sign contracts. They couldn't obtain goods. They couldn't go to court and sue someone. So if their master or boss, as we call them now, didn't pay them, too damn bad. They couldn't, give, they couldn't give evidence in court. They couldn't sue a white person. As you see in the Strader case, they couldn't serve on juries. Right? Uh, this, this might be some interest, but where do you think gun control laws were invented? Georgia. Why? Because the Klan didn't want black people to be armed. Okay? The dirty origin of gun control is that it was invented to disarm freedmen. That way the Klan could lynch them without having any opposition. So the first gun control statute in, in America was actually from Georgia, and we, actually before the Civil War, but especially after, so that blacks couldn't own arms. Uh, I was just in Tennessee this weekend, I was symposium him on the Second Amendment, and uh, the Tennessee Constitution used to say, all white men have the right to bear arms. And after the Civil War, they just crossed out the white part. <laughs> and they crossed out the men part later. So now it's just <laughs> all, all people. But the dirty history of gun control is it was based on means to subjugate blacks. An entire legal system was created to recreate slavery in every sense of the word. And this was done almost exclusively through property and occupation licensing regimes. Right? This, this was saying you can't own property, you can't earn an honest living, you can't do the things that free people can do. So in other words, all the freedmen were able to do was go back and work on a farm. And perhaps they were getting some menial wage, but that wage would probably be taken by their living expenses. Right? The goal of, of the Black Codes was to basically resurrect slavery. And this happened really fast, like within a, within a year or two of the 13th Amendment. It was not, this did not take a while for them to figure out. They couldn't vote, forget about voting. So, at the time in Washington, the Reconstruction Congress, these are the radical Republicans, right? They were pushing very hard for change. One of the first things they realized was that we need, we mean the federal government, the federal government needs to protect certain inherent civil rights. We need to protect these rights. So they passed what was called the Civil Rights Act of 1866. Okay? The Civil Rights Act of 1866 said was a statute that the states cannot violate certain inherent civil rights, among them the right to contract, to make contracts, right? The right to use and dispose of property, the right to bear arms, the right to obtain property as you wish, the right to give evidence, the right to sue and be sued, right? These were inherent civil rights that were deemed implicit in being a citizen of the United States. Okay? President Andrew Johnson 
vetoed that bill. Why did he veto that bill? He said this is a mere statute. Congress doesn't have the power through a statute to limit what the states can do. You need an amendment for that. Now, the radical Republicans had such a supermajority, they overrode that veto, and it, was signed to, and it was signed to law anyway. But they realized that this protection of these civil rights was so important that they couldn't leave it to a statute. They feared that after the war, the Democrats in the South would take over again, and they would repeal the Civil Rights Act. They realized that they had to constitutionalize. They had to make the protection of these rights as a matter of constitutional law, where only a supermajority could ever repeal it. Okay? This is the background for the 14th Amendment. Okay? This is what the case is talking about, the purpose of the 14th Amendment, however you will. It was to ensure that certain civil rights and liberties were given to the freedmen. Now, what makes the amendment so difficult to understand? Oh, by the way, this, this is the Civil Rights Act of 1866. Uh, it basically tried to declare that all persons born in the United States are citizens, regardless of race or color. Okay? And they have the right to, this is on the website, you can get later, to enforce contracts to sue, to be parties to give evidence to inherent pr uh, property, to purchase, lease, sell, convey real and personal property and full and equal benefits of the law. Okay? This provision by statute is the backdrop of how we should understand the 14th Amendment. What the 14th Amendment was trying to do was to take this statute, which was probably unconstitutional, and put it into the Constitution. Okay? So we get down to the 14th Amendment. The 14th Amendment does a lot of things. We're going to spend probably the next month on this. Okay? Yeah. We'll, we'll come back to this, these words many times. And everyone, if you want, just turn to your book, page 48. Just, just take it out. We'll be, you, don't need, you don't need to copy it down. There's way too much for you to copy. You have it here. It's not that long. It's actually one of our longer amendments. The five sections take up roughly about a page, almost two pages in your, in, in your, in your little book. All right? The 14th Amendment transformed our Constitution. There's no other way of saying it. This showed that the first hundred and or roughly hundred years of our Constitution was deficient. That it permitted the South under the auspices of states' rights to violate certain inherent civil rights of the people, namely that of slavery, equal treatment under the law. This bill was drafted by people who want to change that balance. Okay. The first thing you'll notice about at least Section 1 of the 14th Amendment is that it makes no reference to race. None. It speaks of all persons. All persons. Now, we know Congress was capable of writing about race, they wrote about it in the Civil Rights Act of 1866. I showed it to you a minute ago. It said that you're, you can't be disparaged right based on your race. The 15th Amendment says you can't be denied the right to vote based on your race. So we know they understood the idea of race. But this is framed in very broad terms. The challenge of interpreting the 14th Amendment is trying to balance the history of the Civil War and Reconstruction with the actual words of the amendment. The amendments are worded so broadly, but the history is fairly narrow. What you'll see is a case in Slaughterhouse and others. They interpret it based on the history of it, and they didn't give much credence to the broad expanse of terms like equal protection and all persons. Right? This is going to be the debate we have over the next I don't know, 150 years, to this day even, of who does... 14th Amendment protect. If it said no state shall uh, deny equal protection uh, based on race, if it said that, that would be pretty clear. But it doesn't say that. It just says no state shall deny any person equal protection laws. So this is significant. Let's, let's walk through clause by clause. All right. Is anyone here actually naturalized or have become a citizen not by birth? When you were naturalized? You know when? Do you know 
why you were naturalized? What what constitutional authority allowed you to be naturalized? <laughs> Bingo. So yeah. So when I used to clerk in the district court, one of my favorite parts of my job, I loved it, was when we had the naturalization ceremony. Did it ceremony here in Houston or yeah. the courthouse? No, they did it at like That's cool. And uh, well, where I did, I was in Middle Western Pennsylvania, so there weren't enough to fill this school. There were maybe 14 or 15 immigrants at each um, at each session. And one of my favorite parts was they actually became naturalized. And I made sure I told each and every one, I gave each of them a constitution, like I did to you, and I pointed to this. I said, all persons born or naturalized in the United States are citizens of the United States in the state they reside. This is such a powerful concept. Before this, our constitution was silent on citizenship. Go read through it. Not a word. Not a word on what United States citizenship was. It spoke of state citizenship. It spoke of citizenship, but not how you become a citizen. This single sentence made everyone born in the United States not only a citizen of the United States, but also a citizen of the state in which they reside. Think about that for a moment. If you were a, an African slave born in a plantation in Georgia, with this amendment, you've just gotten a double whammy. You are now a citizen of the United States, and with that, all the privileges of being a citizen of the United States, and you are now a citizen of Georgia, and the laws of Georgia now apply to equally. This, this changed everything, this one sentence. Okay, And the naturalized part, too, that's with my friend over there, when you come as an immigrant and you go through the naturalization process, you are now naturalized in the United States. Right? So this was constitutionalizing citizenship. And this added millions of new citizens to the country. All right, questions on, section, on the first clause. Okay, let's go to the second clause. The second clause, unfortunately, is one you probably have never heard of. Yet to the drafter of the 14th Amendment, this was the most significant aspect of the amendment. It says, no state shall make or enforce any law which shall... Hope none of you are writing this down. It's in your constitution. Just listen. Yeah, just, just a note. No state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States. Right? So look what happened here. It began, all persons are now citizens. And now as citizens you have these rights. Isn't that beautiful? It first made you a citizen, and that as a citizen you have these rights. Now, you probably never heard of this phrase, privileges or immunities, before. But this is what we call a term of art. Okay? Privileges or immunities, these refer to certain civil rights that were inherent in all three men. Okay? When you see privileges or immunities, just think rights, civil rights. Okay? You've actually seen this before. I mentioned this probably in the first day of class and also maybe once or twice others. In Article 4 of the Constitution, there is the Privileges and Immunities Clause. Okay, I'm going, to, I'm going to be a stickler for this. The one in Article 4 is a privileges and immunities. The one in the 14th Amendment is a privileges or immunities. So this is privileges and, and this one in the 14th Amendment is privileges or. Don't get them confused. It's a pet peeve because people always get them confused. Judges get them confused. It drives me crazy. They're different. Okay. What did Article 4 say? Okay. This was a provision that says the citizens of each state shall be entitled to all privileges and immunities of citizens in several states. What does this mean? If a state gives any rights to its own citizens, it can't deny them to out-of-staters. What's, what's the example? Well, there was a case in the 1820s called Corfeld v. Coriel. This was 
uh, mentioned in your reading through spots. It was actually written by Justice Bushrod Washington. He was George Washington's nephew. Uh, he's actually buried at Mount Vernon next to the general. Uh, and everybody's Mount Vernon. Isn't it? It's beautiful. It's nice, right? It's pretty cool. Yeah, anyway, so if you ever go see the general's grave, uh, uh, Bushrod Washington is buried next to him. This is obelisk. And what did Corporal be Coriol involved? Okay. So, anyone ever rake oysters or clams? Okay, anyway, you, you, you rake oysters or clams. I think it was New Jersey passed a law basically banning people from Pennsylvania from raking oysters in New Jersey waters. Okay? Basically, they're trying to discriminate against out-of-staters. If you were a New Jersey resident, you were allowed to, but not if from Pennsylvania. Now, what Bushrod Washington said was that the, four, the, the this privileges and immunities clause is implicated. Why? Because the right to earn an honest living, right, the right to pursue a calling, a fisherman, that is an inherent civil right. That is a privilege and immunity. That is one of our rights as freedmen. Okay? He listed several, the rights to make contracts, the right to acquire property, the right to sue and be sued, the right to earn an honest living. You see these repeated over and over and over and over and over again, that these are certain rights that the people have. Okay? These are what privileges and immunities are. And it's this background that informs the 14th Amendment's Privileges and Immunities Clause. Okay? Oh, what are these little animal icons? When everyone logs on to look at it, they get these weird uh, icons. Like, this is an anonymous squirrel, this is an anonymous walrus, anonymous owl, anonymous camel. Anyway. This, yeah, you're distracted. Pay attention. <laughs> these are honest. Okay. So, what did this clause actually do? The Privileges or Immunities Clause. Okay? It said that states can no longer violate certain rights. Rights held by citizens of the United States. What are these rights? Well, if you read the ratification debates of the 14th Amendment, there were a lot of statements about what rights were included. They mentioned Justice uh, Bushrod Washington's opinion about the rights to, give, uh, uh, to make contracts, the right to pursue an honest living, the right to dispose of property, that these were certain rights. But even more important, if you read the speech of one Senator Jacob Howard from Michigan, he made very clear that among the privileges or immunities of citizenship are the first eight amendments of the Bill of Rights. This was a big deal. We mentioned before the case of Barron versus Baltimore. Up until this point, the Bill of Rights did not apply to the states. The First Amendment, freedom of speech, didn't apply to states. No uh, establishment of a church didn't apply to states. The states could establish any church they wanted. In fact, most of the states did have a church until the 1840s. What the framers of the 14th Amendment said is it's not good enough that the Bill of Rights limits the federal government. Now, the Bill of Rights will limit the states. That states can't punish speech, because all the southern states would basically shut down any pro-union newspapers. The states can't limit the right to bear arms. They would just disarm all the other freedmen, right? The states can't seize property without compensation. Rebels would take slaves and whatever they wanted, right? The purpose of the 14th Amendment, as intended by, the, by its framers, was to, the phrase we use is incorporate or extend the first eight amendments of the Constitution to the states. Okay. This was generally accepted to understand what happened. Unfortunately, the Supreme Court didn't agree with the framers, but we'll, we'll get to that in a few minutes. So this clause, this privileges or immunities clause, was meant to do the heavy lifting. In other words, this was meant to be the strongest aspect of the 14th Amendment. This clause, that's why it came first. Okay. Any questions on privileges or immunities? I have, I have a special place in my heart for this because I've done a lot of work on it, so I'm a little obsessive. Yes? Um, can you explain what the difference is between the privileges and immunities clause in the Constitution versus the amendment? So the, there's the Article 4 privileges and immunities, and there's a uh, 14th Amendment privileges or immunities. What the Article 4 provision said was states can't discriminate against out-of-staters. So New Jersey can't deny 
a Pennsylvania fisherman the ability to access their waters. Right? You actually have this case litigated today. New Hampshire passed a law that said in order to be a member of the New Hampshire bar, you had to be a resident of New Hampshire. You couldn't live in Massachusetts. Because what would happen is people who lived in Massachusetts would just take the New Hampshire bar and never work there. And New Hampshire didn't like this. So New Hampshire had a law saying if you want to be a member of the New Hampshire bar, you have to live in New Hampshire. The Supreme Court said that's unconstitutional. You can't discriminate against out-of-staters. Some states you might see charge one fee for a hunting license to uh, uh, in-staters and another fee to out-of-staters, right? That's permitted because they say hunting is not really a... It doesn't make sense. But there are cases where the Supreme Court has said you can't discriminate against out-of-staters, and it's under the Article 4 Privileges and Immunities Clause. that makes sense? Anyone else on this one? Yes, sir. Um, why uh, only the first eight and not the ninth and tenth? Ah, so what does the ninth and tenth amendment say? Uh, I was waiting for that question. We uh, cannot uh, deny or disparage. Uh, sorry, the enumeration. Uh, well, let's start with ten. What does the tenth amendment say? Uh, any power is not delegated to the uh, federal government or subject about the state or by the state. Would it make any sense to incorporate that to the states? The Tenth Amendment says all the power is not given to the federal government, reserved to the states. Would that make any sense to apply to the states? No. And the Ninth is a similar one. The Ninth is a rule of construction. Okay. It basically says all rights not given are retained by the people. Right. That doesn't implicate any limitations placed on the government. In other words, the first eight amendments of the Constitution all limit what the government can do. That is what the, the framers of the 14th Amendment want to do to the state, limit what they can do. Say you can't violate this right, you can't violate that right, you can't disarm people, you can't limit their free speech, you can't shut down newspapers. Make sense? A very good question. I wrote like an entire thing on that one question. All right. All right. The next clause in the 14th Amendment you've seen before. Oops. It says, Has anyone been to Magna Carta yet? Oh my god, you're pathetic. Seriously, go. Just just find find a weekend to go, preferably before the end of the semester, because I'm going to mention it like, like five times today. Okay. You should go. Let it go, right? Let it go. You guys are frozen. Anyway, so it says, nor, there, oh, finally someone got it. It says, nor shall any state, right, deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. Now, you've seen this in other, sh in other shades. You've seen this in the Fifth Amendment to the Constitution. The Fifth Amendment says that the federal government can't deprive a person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. So let's focus on this in some detail for a moment. Life, liberty, or property. Okay? You've all probably read, and I hope you know this is a Declaration of Independence, not the Constitution, that life, liberty, or property is framed in similar fashions. You've seen it as life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. What are these three things, these threefold guarantees of freedom? Right? The government can't arbitrarily take your life. The government can't arbitrarily take away your freedom. The government can't arbitrarily remove your property. And property includes not just stuff you have, but your right to earn a living, your right to pursue a calling. Right? They can't arbitrarily infringe this unless they give you due process of law. Now what is this phrase, due process of law? What does this mean? Okay. If you've gone to see Magna Carta, you'd know the answer. <laughs> but Magna Carta said that a person can't be taken away, deceased means taken away their property unless judged by their peers or the laws of the land. Right? What are these laws of the land? It's this notion that there's some sort of higher power that places limits on what government can do. This was the essence of Magna Carta, that there was a power above the king 
limit the king's action. This is why this was such a significant document. Right? You could not take someone's life, liberty, or property without due process of law. Okay? Now, we'll say this later, but you might just look at the word process and think, oh, process, that means you have to give someone procedural stuff, right? Give them a judge, give them a jury, give them a hearing. This is a con not a controversial, but this is a disputed point. Was this only a, a procedural provision? In other words, if I want to say, oh, let's say, I want to sterilize someone from being mentally retarded. This was an, we'll do this case later, right? I determine that someone's mentally retarded, and I want to sterilize her um, because I don't think she should reproduce, and it will be bad for society. I give her a hearing, right? She, she has a hearing. The judge sits there and says, yep, you are mentally retarded. The statute says I can sterilize you. Doctor, take it away and cut out her ovaries. Was she given due process of law? Well, she was given a hearing. They processed it, and they followed the law. But is there something more? That's the case Buck v. Bell. We'll do this case in a few weeks. This actually happened, by the way. A lot. You think, eugen you think eugenics were created by the Nazis? We invented it. They perfected it. Okay? So due process of law was understood to also have something called a substantive component. That is, there's certain violations of law that no amount of process can satisfy. That there's certain infringements of liberty that are so great that no matter how many hearings you get, you are not satisfying the law of the land or due process of law. This is what's often called substantive due process, and we'll spend an entire month on this. But it's a notion that there are limits on how the government can deprive you of liberty. So abortion, you know, sodomy, you name it, comes from this clause. As we'll discuss in a few minutes, the sad fact is the slaughterhouse cases slaughtered the first clause. They basically read the privileges or immunities clause out of the Constitution. They, they said it doesn't mean anything meaningful. As a result, courts have shifted to the second clause, the due process clause. This is like probably 90% of constitutional law that you'll study next month. Okay? But the original plan was privileges or immunities would carry the heavy weight, but the slaughterhouse case basically ignored that. All right. Third one, any questions on due process before I continue? Anything? Okay. The third clause, the Equal Protection Clause, this is the one that you're probably most familiar with. This is the one which we always talk about. Uh, you know, everyone always knows, oh, equal protection, Brown versus Board of Education, right? This is what people mostly study. But let's read what it actually says. It says, the government, I'm sorry, the state, cannot deny to any person. Again, notice it uses the word person. It doesn't say based on race or color. It says any person. It doesn't say man. It says person. Okay? The, the state can't deny to any person the equal protection of the laws. Okay. So ask yourself, what does that mean? The equal protection of the laws. Let's say uh, Louisiana passes a statute that says all train cars will be segregated, blacks will go in one car, whites will go in another. And a white person attempts to go into the black car and he's arrested. And then a black person, let's call him Homer Plessy, decides to go to the white car and he gets arrested. Was the law equally applied there? Well, in a technical sense, the answer is yes. The law says blacks in one car, whites in another, and someone who violates that clause is punished, then they're applying the law equally. It's a jarring thought, right? But this was actually prevailing wisdom of Plessy versus Ferguson. This is what separate but equal meant. There were equal accommodations in separate cars, but the law was being applied equally. Everyone see that? It's a perverse thought. The other alternative is what you probably think is the law can't discriminate based on race. In other words, the law can't treat differently a black person and a white person. Right? That's what you might think. But look very carefully at the words. You should not be denied the equal protection of the laws. Does it say you can't discriminate based on class or race or color? It doesn't. 
So again, this is the challenge of the 14th Amendment. It uses very broad terms that are not self-defining. All right? What does it mean, equal protection of the laws? Can you have a, a, a statute, like, for example, one in Louisville, Kentucky, where it said blacks live in this neighborhood and whites live in this neighborhood? And if anyone tries to live across, we'll punish them. Are the laws being applied equally there? Are, are each one getting equal protection? No. These were, these were the way these things were, were interpreted. We'll spend also several weeks on this uh, clause. All right, questions on equal protection? All right, the, the rest of the 14th Amendment, which I'll mention, yes, this is right. I, uh, <laughs> I, I think I blogged about this. There was actually a clerical error. So Mississippi never actually formally ratified the 13th Amendment, and like a law student discovered it like a year ago, and the legislature did last year. You're right. I, I, I forgot this. Actually, would anyone be interested in a field trip? I thought about this, but I think, no, I seriously considered it. But I thought, who the hell would want to go with me on a Sunday to see a museum? Would anyone be interested? Okay, I'll do it. Like on a Sunday? I okay. I no, I seriously consider this. I'm like, they're not going to want to spend a weekend with me. All right. Um, yeah, no, no, I know, I know. Okay. Uh, let me, let me. All right, let, I'll do it. What? Okay, okay. What? What day? Let's do it now. After spring break? What about, um, we have spring break on the, the week of the 18th, right? What about March 30th? That's a Sunday. Okay, I can do, I can do March 30th or April 6th? April 6th? All right. You have two dates, March 30th or April 6th? March 30th? April 6th. I think March 30th takes it. All right, March 30th it is. All right, I'll, 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 I'll like noon, yeah? All right, I'll do it. I'll, I'll call the museum today. Yeah, and I'll actually invite my property students too because it's actually a property exhibit. All right. All right, done. Done. All right, we'll do it. Maybe I'll open up to other classes too, but uh, I can probably get with a dose and suit to help out. Yeah, I'll, yeah, I'll think about this later. All right. Any any questions on any other questions on protection? I'll run you through the rest of the Fourth Amendment somewhat quickly because it's not really relevant, but it's interesting stuff. So the question in the Minor versus Happersett case, right, was did the Fourteenth Amendment guarantee women the right to vote, right? I'm going to go briefly to the 15th Amendment, then come back. Okay? The 15th Amendment says, the 15th Amendment says, the right of citizens of the United States to vote okay, shall not be denied or abridged. Right? Two things. We're not just talking about denying the right to vote. We're talking about abridging, which means limiting. So these things like poll taxes and grandfather clauses. Right? Everyone knows what I mean by that? Mm -hmm. So one of the things that the southern states did to limit the franchise was they enacted a host of laws to make it difficult for freedmen to vote, one of which was a grandfather clause. It says, unless your grandfather voted, you can't vote. And of course, all the grandfathers were slaves, so they couldn't vote, right? Something called a literacy test, which is this really difficult test. I mean, you want to Google them, look at them. They're, I, can't, I can't do them. These are really hard tests with about reading comprehension. And you have to have some poor freedmen who had never gone to school in his life pass this test, which is, I mean, is impossible. The white people didn't do it. Okay? You had the poll tax, which was eventually outlawed by the 24th Amendment. The poll tax said you have to eventually pay a, a poll, a tax to go vote. Right? Whites didn't have to pay this. But, you know, blacks would be charged a tax. Right? There are all these devices meant at maybe not banning the vote for the freedmen, but making it effectively impossible to do so. Yeah. I might have a question about like <clears throat> now you have uh, like some states enacting uh, uh, like voter requirements like carry you have to carry ID and stuff like that. Uh, and it disproportionately affects black people. So I'm just wondering if because that doesn't make it impossible or nearly impossible to vote, but it does make it quite harder. So oh, such a good question. Okay, so let me 
let me let me finish this. I'll ask a question in like a minute. Okay, I promise. Okay, so it says the right of citizens of the United States to not be denied or abridged by the United States, or by any state, right, on account of race, color, or previous condition of servitude. That means formerly a slave, right. This finished off the Reconstruction Amendments. I promise I'll answer your question by guaranteeing the freedmen the right to vote. Okay. Now, what's interesting is that nowhere in our Constitution does it say you have the right to vote. All it says is you can't abridge the right to vote based on X, based on race, the 19th Amendment, based on gender. Right, based on being under the age of 18, uh, you know, over the age of 18. So this didn't actually grant a right to vote. Right, this was seen as kind of a pre-existing right. It just said, who can it be limited to? Okay. So let me answer your question now. So you might have read a lot about the voting rights. Okay, what are voting rights? So Congress in the 1960s passed something called the Voting Rights Act. Now, what the Voting Rights Act did was it said that certain states, which have a history of racial discrimination in elections, aren't allowed to be trusted to manage their own election affairs. Okay? They need to get permission from Washington before they make any changes to their voting structure. If they want to move a polling place, they want to uh, uh, you know, change the, the, the form used to register to vote, anything, they need to get permission from Washington. Okay? And what the Supreme Court said in a case a year ago called Shelby Counter v. Holder was that this was unconstitutional, okay? That this infringed the sovereignty of the states. That the maps used to draw up which states are protected and which states are not, these maps are 50 years old, and that times have changed. We're not living in the 1960s anymore. It was one of these bizarre things where Manhattan and Brooklyn were covered by Queens and Staten Island. We're not. Alaska was covered by the Voting Rights Act. Uh, I don't think that's much of a problem in Alaska, but you know, lots of lots of uh, uh, discrepancies were found in these coverage formulas. So the Supreme Court found that the coverage formula is unconstitutional. So as a result, Texas, which was formerly covered by this Voting Rights Act, is no longer covered. Okay. So that so as a result, not as a result, but in tandem with this, Texas implemented something called voter ID, which if anyone has gone to vote tomorrow, you'll know that you have to show ID to vote. If you don't have ID, you can cast a provisional ballot, and you have to show your, your residence at some point afterwards. And Texas passes these laws under the auspices of preventing voter fraud, okay? Um, now, you're exactly right, uh, uh, that Aaron, that uh, these laws are shown to have disproportionate impacts on people of color uh, who tend not to have ID as a high of an incidence, right? So, interestingly enough, to find a violation of the 15th Amendment, you need to show an intentional desire to disenfranchise blacks, right? In other words, you have to have evidence that the people in the state housing, wow, we really need to take away the rights of blacks to vote, or something close to that. That's not going to happen. Right? First, people are not stupid enough to say that. And second, the people who are passing this, I think, in, in some part, legitimately believe in voter fraud. Whether it's accurate or not, they believe in this. Okay. So the second issue is under the Voting Rights Act, even though the maps are gone, the Department of Justice is still saying that there is intentional discrimination against minority voters in Texas. Right? Texas, of course, always ground zero for common law. It's a good place to teach. So uh, the issue that's going to be uh, probably for the Supreme Court next year is does a voter ID law uh, uh, violate the Voting Rights Act? Now, what's interesting is that in 2004 or five, Indiana, not really a state with, with a history of slavery, passed a voter ID law, and the Supreme Court upheld it by voters six to three. But the difference here is we're in Texas and not Indiana. And does that make a difference? So that's going to be an issue coming up very soon. Questions? Yeah. So basically, under the 15th Amendment, in order to show violation, you have to show evidence of intent on the part of the legislature to just Pretty much, yeah. All right. But let's talk about the ladies now, right? Abigail Adams said, remember the ladies. Everyone know that quote? Abigail Adams wrote to John Adams said, always remember the ladies. So what about the ladies? Could they vote? But well, what does it say here? The right of citizens of the United States to vote should not be denied or abridged based on race, color, or servitude. Does it say anything about gender? It's silent about gender. Okay? 
So does the 15th Amendment help the ladies in their, in their march for suffrage? Not really. Not really. So where do the ladies try to associate the right to vote? This is, this is the Mina versus Haberset case. They said that the right to vote is a privilege or immunity of citizenship, which the states cannot not abridge. We'll do the minor case in, in, in a bit, but they said the states can't abridge this right of citizenship. They said the 14th Amendment is framed in terms of all persons. Okay, I think it's like, it's like 15 or $20. It's not expensive. Okay, I might be able to get a group discount. I'm going to call I'm calling you today. I don't think we're a law student. I, I'm going to call today. I might have to get a group. If you can schedule a group tour, you should give a discount. But I'll, I'll find out. Okay? All right? Privileges or immunities. Okay? So they said this applies to all persons, regardless of gender. A problem with their theory, though, is actually in Section 2 of the 14th Amendment, which speaks of what happens if male inhabitants are denied the right to vote. This is actually the first time the Constitution that gender is used. I mean, we always have like the he pronoun, but that's generally how we refer to uh, any pronoun. But the word male is there. So effectively, the 14th Amendment made clear the text of it that we're talking about males being denied the right to vote. Okay, so this is why we'll get we'll, we'll get to the, the minor versus Harper Street case. Okay. Uh, okay. Section three. Section three is actually interesting. Um, it says that if you were formerly a rebel, you you took an oath to the Confederacy, you cannot serve the United States government. This had the effect of wiping out the entire governing class of the South, so that Georgia and Mississippi could not send back former Confederates to Washington. Okay. Even better, if any of the states wanted to even send people to Washington, they had to ratify the 14th Amendment. This is the part they show in the Lincoln movie. Basically, the, the Northerners said, if you even want to have an election, you need to ratify our amendment first, which is questionable the 14th Amendment was even ratified properly. The states did not ratify their own volition. They were required to ratify the 14th Amendment in order to send people to Washington to Congress. That was probably an unconstitutional condition, but we, we don't question that anymore. Okay. Okay. Uh, section four. Don't don't worry much about. Okay. Section five is a biggie, right? Section five concerns the enforcement powers of Congress. It's framed exactly like section two of the Thirteenth Amendment. Section five of the Fourteenth Amendment gives Congress the power to enforce by appropriate legislation, the provisions of this article. What does that mean? Congress can pass a law to ensure that the states don't violate people's equal rights. So have any of you studied in torts section 1983? You say that? Okay. It's a provision that actually allows people to sue States for violating their federal rights. It comes from this. This gives Congress a lot of power to ensure that people are not being deprived of their rights. All right, we'll study. We'll study Section Five a lot more in the next class. But uh, keep keep this one in mind. All right. Okay. We did the Fifteenth Amendment. Okay. All right. That was a expanded version of what I did on day one about the Reconstruction Amendments. Any questions on that before I go to the cases? Everyone with me? Yeah? Mm -hmm. Right? Yes, sir. I'm sorry. Uh, so Section 5 uh, gave Congress, or, or allowed Congress to deny representation to anyone that did not uh, ratify it. Well, no, 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 no. As a matter of just power, they said, unless you ratify, we won't let you have representation. That was before the amendment was even ratified. So Mississippi ratified the 14th. Mississippi ratified the 14th, but not the 13th. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. They ratified in 2013. I remember that. I should can't remember everything. Okay. Everyone with me? 
questions. Let's move on to the cases then. So it's it's somewhat funny that the very first case to come before the Supreme Court in 1873, this is five years after the 14th Amendment was ratified, had absolutely nothing to do with slavery. It had absolutely nothing to do with civil rights that you might think of. It had to do with something as silly as a slaughterhouse in New Orleans. Did anyone go to Mardi Gras? Huh, they wouldn't be here right now, would they? <laughs> you went? You're back? Yeah. Wow. It was, was it fun? Oh, yeah. I mean, when did you get back? Yesterday? Oh, yeah, I got back. I bet some of your classmates didn't get back yet. Uh, yeah. Well, they took my wife for the day off. So. Uh, I bet. Yeah, I, <laughs> I, I, I did a carnival thing for Saturday night, but I, I can't. I don't think I can handle Mardi Gras. That'd be too much for me. So, so you know, you know, um, uh, uh, New Orleans. What's that bridge that goes over the Mississippi? What's it? The, the Crescent. Uh, what's it? The Crescent. What's it called? That's it. The Crescent City Connection, right? So back in the 1860s, or I guess late 1860s. Um, Mississippi passed a law. I'm sorry, Mississippi. Louisiana passed a law. Say Mississippi. Okay, this law said that all slaughterhouses where you butcher animals had to be located across the river. It's called the Crescent City something, right? You had to, to put everything there. Okay. That sounds like, oh yeah, that sounds like a good idea, right? Well, what did that law have the effect of doing? Any butcher that was within the city limit was immediately put out of business, shut down. If you wanted to sell meat, you had to bring your animals across the river to this other place, have them slaughtered, and then bring them back to the city to sell the limits. This benefit, we might call today crony capitalism, was hoisted on one single monopoly. It was called, I think it's called the Crescent City Butcher Society or something. In other words, one company got all of the business for butchering in the entire city of New Orleans. All of it. So if you were a butcher in New Orleans before this, your shop was shut down, and then you now have to pay the additional expense of schlepping your animals across the river, killing it there, and bring it back. This is actually a picture, or actually, I'm sorry, a wood cutting of New Orleans Slaughterhouse. I, mean, I know you can't read that, but imagine these are just these huge long rows where they just basically slice and dice animals. Uh, it looks very clean here, but it wasn't so clean. And I think right beyond there, that's the Mississippi. So this was right in the banks of the river. Right? <laughs> Actually, I, I almost went there once. I went to New Orleans, but I didn't have time, but I had a friend who went there for me. Got a picture of it. All right? So the question here is, can the state do this? Right? Does the state have this power? So the first case before the Supreme Court was the 14th Amendment has nothing to do with the black codes, or segregated facilities, or denying rights to vote, or you know lynchings and killings of, of freedmen. No, no, no. It has to do with butchers and slaughterhouses. Now, I ask you just to skim the majority, um, because I think the dissent does a fairly good job of describing the issues. But the reason why I ask you to skim the majority is that it's not very good. Okay? But what do I mean by that? It's almost certainly wrong. Everyone agrees that the court got this one wrong. Okay, so let's do the majority first. What did the majority say? Let's go back up to the Fourth Amendment. The majority looked at this case with the lens of the police power, right? We've discussed the police power many times before. The police power is the ability of the state to regulate the health, safety, welfare, and morals, right? So we look at it in one sense that this law was probably aimed at protecting health and safety. Instead of having all these little dingy, you know, butchers located throughout New Orleans, I mean, you can imagine how dingy it is today. Imagine what it was like 100 years ago. It's pretty bad, right? Instead of having all those, you have this nice, clean, pristine slaughterhouse across the river, right? But if you think about it, this law was quite broad. Instead of regulating how hygiene standards would have to be, saying if you have a butcher shop, you need to keep it clean, inspected, whatever, they effectively put out of business everyone in the butcher profession. They just they all lost their business. This is a violation of what we might call the right to earn an honest living, or the right to pursue a vocation, right? 
what is the relationship then of the police power? How broad is the police power? So the answer before the 14th Amendment, the police power was, a, was, was quite broad. There were really not many limits that could be placed on how the state can regulate the health and safety of its people, right? But the question here is what did the 14th Amendment do to change that, okay? Did the 14th Amendment, which has no state shall make, it, make or enforce any law, which shall bridge the privileges of immunity of citizenship, did that law restrict the ability of the states to have their police power, right? If the right to earn an honest living is a privilege or immunity of citizenship, the state can't abridge it. Okay, there's a limit. In other words, let's use, let's, use an, let's use an easy example. Before the 14th Amendment, states did not have to respect the freedom of the press. Okay? After the 14th Amendment, if a state shuts down a newspaper, they can't do it because they're now bound by the Constitution, the federal Constitution. Same here. If the right to earn an honest living is a privilege or immunity of citizenship, then the states can't abridge it. Okay? So what did the court do here? Now, I'm going to preface it again by saying the court was wrong. Um, this is a case that's viewed by everyone, left, right, or center, as incorrectly decided. Okay? What did the court say? Well, the court looked at it like this. They said, the clause says, no state shall make or enforce any law which will the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States. Okay, so here it speaks of privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States. In other words, federal privileges or immunities. And then they looked at the other one in Article 4 that speaks of privileges and immunities of state citizens. So you see what he did here. He said, well, you have these privileges and immunities of states and you have these privileges and immunities of federal citizenship. These are two separate sets of rights. Everyone follow me. You have state privileges and immunities, and you have federal privileges and immunities. What does the 14th Amendment say? All the 14th Amendment says is that states can't violate these federal privileges or immunities. In other words, the 14th Amendment did not at all limit the police power of the state except for these limited federal privileges or immunities. So I said a few minutes ago that those who ratified the 14th Amendment thought that this clause would protect the first eight amendments of the Constitution, rights of property, rights of contract, rights to bear arms, right? The right to make contracts, the right to sue and be sued. That's what the framers of the amendment said. What the majority says is, no, 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 no. It doesn't include all those what we might call now civil rights. No, no, no. These are only federal privileges and immunities. What are these? Really stupid things. He lists them. The right to come to the seat of government to assert a claim. The right to seek protection from the federal government on the high seas. Access to the seaports. Access to the sub-treasuries. The right to use in navigable waters of the United States. He lists these series of like 10 or 11 really stupid rights. We didn't fight a civil war over the right to access sub-treasuries. Okay? We didn't fight at Antietam to make sure people had the right to navigate the waters. Okay? This opinion had to flagrantly ignore the very words of those who drafted the amendment five years after it happened. So here we are in the year 2014 trying to understand what, what, how are these phrases understood. Yet a judge who lived during that time, five years later, has to ignore the very debates that were had. Now, he's not stupid, right? He's not being intentionally ignorant. He was trying to do something very deliberate here, okay? 
because if you think about it, what would happen if Congress had actually intended for the states to protect all these other rights? First, the police power would have been greatly diminished. Okay. Second, it'd be the federal courts who'd be responsible for policing all violations of civil rights by the southern states. And third, Congress, under its Section 5 powers, was now able to pass laws limiting the state police power. Okay. After the Civil War, everything was very shaky and precarious. Right? Remember the South will rise again? Yeah, that was pretty strong back then. It wasn't so clear that a union would survive. What the court was doing here was they were saying, we're not going to read this broadly. We're going to keep this narrow. All that we're going to do is say that you can't have slaves. <laughs> That's basically it. That's all we're going to say is you can't have slaves. Anything short of that, whatever. So what the court did in the slaughterhouse cases was they effectively deleted this clause from the Constitution. Right? They just, they just deleted it. X it out. It has no meaning whatsoever in the Constitution. Now, the Supreme Court had an opportunity to revisit this clause in 2010 in a case called McDonald versus City of Chicago. Which I'll talk about probably later when we do guns. But in that case, the lawyers and I work with these guys, so disclosure, asked the court to say the right to bear arms is a privilege or immunity of citizenship. It's right there in the debates. Chicago banned the possession of handguns. Chicago violated the privileges or immunities clause. Eight justices of the Supreme Court basically said, yeah, that seems like a good argument, but we're not going to reverse 100 years of precedent. I, I was in the court for that. Uh, Justice Scalia called this the, the darling of the professoriate, that the professors would love to change this, uh, 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 but the justice did not buy it. There's only Justice Thomas who wrote a very erudite opinion saying that the privileges or immunities clause should be coming back and that this does protect the right to bear arms and other rights. Okay? So after the slaughterhouse cases, this is a dead letter. Kaput. That's why everything shifted to due process. Nearly everything that we'll learn in the due process clause was meant to be under the privileges or immunities clause. Okay? <coughs> There was actually a very powerful dissent by Justice Field. Okay? Um, Justice Field argued that this is a naked case of protectionism, that the state is granting a monopoly to one party and one party alone, that this is not something that police power countenances, that it violates a, a right, what we might call an economic liberty, the right to pursue an honest living. Now, these butchers have been engaged in their profession for many years, and they were stopped. Their, their, their profession was stopped, and the government cannot do this. Okay? He basically says, if all the 14th Amendment was meant was to protect the access to the sub-treasuries and the access to the navigable waters, that this was a vain amendment, that this was a waste of time, that this was something fought for with blood of both, of, from both sides to protect so much, and this cannot be the right reason. He also cites Civil Rights Act of 1866, he says, Corfell v. Coriel. He says that these are all the free rights that freedmen should have. The right to pertain property, the rights to pursue an honest living, the right to bear arms, the right to make contracts. That these are things that the government can't arbitrarily de de deny. Right? It can be regulated, but it can't be abridged. Right? Unduly infringed upon. Okay? He says that only is a free government in the American sense of the term under which the inalienable right of every citizen to pursue his happiness is unrestrained, except by just, equal, and impartial laws. That this notion of pursuit of happiness meant you can pursue an honest calling, you can make your life what you want to be. And the government can't limit that unless they have a good reason, and that reason is applied equally to everyone. All right? Questions on that so far? The majority or Justice Field's dissent? Yes, ma'am. Are you saying the case of Sorry? Protectionism. You know what that is? Protectionism means you're passing a law not for the benefit of the people, but to protect certain interests. 
So everyone knows what's happening now in Uber with Houston. Everyone following this? So everyone know what Uber is? Uber is effectively a app on your phone, and you can call with your phone to locate a you know a car service can pick you up, and it takes your GPS location and sends a car right to you. It's very convenient. Uber does not require you to hail a taxi off the street. Therefore, most places outside the scope of regulated taxis, and cities hate it because it puts their taxis out of business, and people love it. So actually, this happened just this week. Uber is trying to enter in Houston because basically there are no taxis in Houston. This would be a very good thing. You call a taxi when you need it. Okay, so of course the city is opposing it because it will de decrease money for the existing people who have taxi licenses. And just yesterday, your city attorney Noah Feldman sent a letter to Uber telling them to cease and desist from petitioning the grievances, uh, basically petitioning members of the city council to change the law. Uh, yes, Uber was sending emails to all the members of the city council, right, saying change the law. The city attorney said you should stop doing this. You're harassing us. Read the First Amendment, Noah Feldman. I actually sent a letter to the Chronicle about this already. But you can't tell, no, I, I, I did. You can't tell, right? You can't tell people to not petition the government for redress of grievances. It's right there in the First Amendment. So lots of states pass laws that have pure protectionism. So, for example, uh, gets from Louisiana. They pass a law saying that in order to sell caskets, right, just a plain wooden box, you need to be a licensed mortician, right? You have to go to embalming school, you have to be trained in embalming fluids. So we had a bunch of monks, uh, 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 the, the Order of St. Uh, Joseph's or St. Abbey's, I can't remember which order it was. These monks, to uh, make money for their, for their parish, would sell boxes, wooden boxes, to, to the parishioners, right? We're just talking about a wooden box. And the state said, you can't do that because you're not a licensed mortician. Okay? The Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals a year ago said that this is unconstitutional, that you have the right to earn an honest living, that you cannot be restricted based on sort of pure protectionism. Why was this law in effect? Because morticians want to keep the business for themselves, right? They didn't want anyone else selling these wooden boxes. And you want the Fifth Circuit struck that down unconstitutional. Okay? But that's the outlier. Almost every case to consider these issues, the government wins. In that case, the outlier. We'll talk about economic liberty later. But that's really about protectionism. You pass a statute saying in order to sell a wooden box, you need to be a mortician. You need to, know how to embalm people, right? Or, 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 or another case, uh, this is actually before the Texas Supreme Court this term. Uh, everyone know what eyebrow threading is? It, it, yeah, it's like you, you take threads and you can pluck out eyebrow hairs, right? Whatever. In, in Texas, in Texas, in order to be an eyebrow threader, you need to be a licensed cosmetologist, which requires over 700 hours of training. You have to know how to dye hair, wash hair, deal with chemicals, you know, various facial treatments, right? 700 hours of training. Meanwhile, eyebrow threaders only use a piece of you know, string, right, to pluck out eyebrows. And actually, the Texas Supreme Court this year will consider, is this protectionism? Is this just made a way cosmetologists have a higher barrier to entry to keep other people out of the field? Right? It's actually funny. You need more hours to be a cosmetologist in Texas to be an emergency uh, uh, vehicle uh, driver. Right? So to be an EMT, is like 645 hours of training. To be a cosmetologist, is 700 hours. Go, go figure that one out. They said they've had similar cases for African hair braiders. People don't actually cut hair, dye hair. They just you know, do braiding. Is that... Those people have to be required to be cosmetologists. Okay? We'll do this later. But the, we, the reason why the slaughterhouse case is so reviled was it effectively cut out an entire part of the Constitution. Very, very sad. And the Supreme Court showed no interest in bringing it back in the McDonald case. All right, other questions on this case before we move on? Sorry, I'm lecturing much more than I like to. I know there's a lot to cover today, so I'm going to have to just kind of push through. But please stop me with questions. All right, so let's move on. So what's kind of funny, though, is the same day that Slaughterhouse was decided, the very next day, we had the case of Brattle, Illinois, right? So the very same justices were saying, oh, you have this right to earn an honest living. We can't deprive these butchers of their profession. The very same day, right? The next day, they say, oh, you're a woman. You're so delicate. You can't be a lawyer. You have to stay home and cook and clean. I'm not exaggerating. In case people didn't read, that, that's that's what the opinion says. So this is this is Miss Myra Bradwell. She was she was a total badass, right? So her husband was a lawyer, and she um, uh, actually what's called reading the law. So there was no law school back then. So in order to become a lawyer, you would be an apprentice to a to a lawyer. So her husband was a lawyer, and 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 she was his apprentice, and she uh, sat for the bar exam. Uh, uh, in Illinois, and she passed it with high scores, and then she applied for admission with the Illinois Supreme Court. And at the time, the Illinois law, the statute, 
didn't say anything about gender, right? It didn't say only men can be admitted. It just said, you know, here are the requirements. You pass the bar, you sit for the apprenticeship, whatever. But the Illinois Supreme Court said, you know, under our common law, under our traditions, women are not eligible for the bar. This is, this is another picture of Ms. Bradwell. Okay? She's the uh, first woman lawyer. So she took her case all the way to the Supreme Court, arguing that it violates the 14th Amendment to deny her the right to become an attorney. By the way, this is actually kind of cool. Um, you know the outcome is she lost, right? But uh, this is actually after her defeat at the Supreme Court, she started a publication called the Chicago Legal News, which she was the editor-in-chief of. And, and th this is really cool. This right here, this is actually a letter uh, from Susan B. Anthony. Uh, this, this was Susan B. Anthony's private collection, her papers, and she, she you can't read that, but it says, the first legal paper edited by a woman, Meyer Bradwell, this file is from 1869, or a quote, it was Ms. Bradwell whose right to be admitted to the bar was carried to the Supreme Court. So this is actually from Susan B. Anthony's personal collection. She kept a copy of Bradwell's first edition, which is really cool. The Library of Congress has this. So um, as, as a fun afterlope, afternote, a couple years after the case, the Illinois bar changed the law to permit women to be admitted. And it's funny, Bradwell never actually bothered to be readmitted, but the, the Illinois Supreme Court, I'm sorry, the Illinois Supreme Court on their own initiative, reversed their opinion, they let her in. And then I think a year or two later, the United States Attorney General moved her admission to the U.S. Supreme Court bar, and they acted on her petition from 20 years earlier. In other words, she never reapplied. So they just took her opinion, her you know, petition 20 years earlier, and they admitted her to the Supreme Court bar, which is kind of, kind of cool. But the case itself is not so cool. Oh, it's been, yeah. So, so this is the letter. So what happened with Mrs. Blackwell? Okay. So when she argued this case... <laughs> yeah. So, so, uh, so, so, where's that put Snooky? A poof. <laughs> yeah, but she has a poof. <laughs> uh, uh, so, when when Brathel argued this case, right, slaughterhouse had not yet been decided, right. So she was. Uh, she didn't argue the case herself. She hired a lawyer. But when her, argue, her lawyer argued the case for her, the slaughterhouse case hadn't been decided. So she wasn't yet aware that apparently the, the Privileges or Immunities Clause guaranteed the right to navigate the waters and to access the Treasury. Right? She, she, she didn't get that memo yet. Like She was actually going on what the framers of the 14th Amendment said, which among them is the right to pursue an honest living, the right to make contracts, things that a lawyer would, would normally do. So um, the, uh, she didn't really argue about equal protection. She didn't really argue about due process. She argued almost exclusively about privileges or immunities. And that was an unfortunate choice because the very day before her opinion came out, the Supreme Court said, privileges or immunities doesn't mean a damn thing. Okay? So what was the court's opinion? So the majority, which was by Justice Miller, he was the guy who wrote Slaughterhouse, said, oh, this is a piece of cake, right? The butcher's lost, so she's certainly going to lose. The state's police power is very broad. The state police power will deny the right to tell butchers where to work. Of course, it can deny the right for the uh, for these for these you know women to not be uh, uh, these aggressive lawyers, right? Okay. But those who dissented in the slaughterhouse case had a much harder burden, right? Why? Because they had all these grand, lofty statements about how the right to earn an honest living and the right to pursue your vocation was so important. This was constitutionally required, but not for women. So the entire opinion is one of just kind of dancing around that issue, right? Uh, and, and, and Justice Bradley's opinion, who, who dissented also in Slaughterhouse, said that, you know, uh, since, since forever women cannot be lawyers, um, you know, they're married, they're, they're, their job is to be domestic, their job is to be, um, uh, you know, in the kitchen, in the home. Um, I'm not exaggerating. Uh, nature herself casts a difference between the spheres and destinies of men and women. Uh, man is woman should be man is the woman's protector. Um, you'll study this in property, actually. So there's something actually called a legal fiction. Everyone know what a legal fiction is? It's something courts make up so something can make sense. So you'll, you'll do this in property. I'll give you a preview. When you had a single woman, she could hold property, right? A married woman could not hold property under most of Western civilization for history. What happened to the woman's property when she got married? Well, she couldn't just transfer it to the husband, right, because it was still the family's property. So they actually created a third person, a fiction, 
So when a husband and wife got married, it actually created another person. And all the wife's property would be deposited in that fictional person. Because then say the husband died and she was a widow, she would then get back the property held in that fake person. This existed for a long time. This was called coverture. You'll, you'll say this in property. So under this regime, women couldn't hold property. Married women couldn't make contracts, right? Married women were not allowed to give evidence in court. And in a, in a really cynical way, if you couldn't make contracts, you couldn't hold property, and you couldn't give evidence in court, you would not be a very effective lawyer. Okay, I'm not, so that's the court's argument here, right? All the things that a lawyer would have to do, women were not eligible to do, right? They couldn't make contracts, they couldn't give property, they couldn't give evidence. So they're actually stopped by the law itself from being lawyers. But the court goes much further than that. They say that um, married women are incapable of doing this, that their, uh, that their sphere is to be the office of wife and mother. Um, this is the law of the creator, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So, all of you ladies in the room, very good. You know, we, we, know, we know what the court said here. Uh, then at the end, they said, you know, we give our, quote, hardiest concurrence, hardiest concurrence, what, what language, to the, uh, to the suffrage movement, right? Right, we give our hardiest concurrence to uh, the efforts to change the laws in order to help you know, women out. But that's not for us. Uh, interestingly enough, Chief Justice Chase dissented in both Slaughterhouse and the Bradwell case. He was actually very much in favor of women being lawyers, but he was in, he was in the dissent. So this case, Bradwell, and the case before at Slaughterhouse, was a double whammy. Between the two of them, they effectively said the privileges or immunities clause doesn't mean a damn thing. It has no significance whatsoever. It doesn't give women any rights. It doesn't give people any rights. In case you're worried, the Supreme Court has reversed this case. <laughs> this case is no longer good law. Girls are allowed to be lawyers. It, it, it is permitted now. I, should, I hope everyone in this room knows this. You know, phew, right? Uh, but what's interesting is that the Supreme Court developed, you know, case law discussing racial discrimination back in the 1870s and 80s, all the way through the 1950s and 60s. The Supreme Court did not say that gender should be protected by the Constitution officially. 1971. 1972. Uh, this was actually Justice Ruth Bader, Bin uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who at the time was working with the ACLU. This was her uh, uh, mission to try and get gender written into the 14th Amendment. Um, uh, she succeeded, but like in the 1920s, uh, 1970s. So what's interesting is in 19... Oh, I'll do this in a minute. Uh, there was also something called the Equal Rights Amendment. Has anyone ever heard of that? So the Equal Rights Amendment was a proposed amendment for the Constitution that never got enough states. Uh, it basically died out in the 1970s. And it said, the equality of rights under the law should not be denied or abridged on account of sex. Right? This would have written into the Constitution what Meyer Bradwell thought was already there. That the government can't discriminate based on sex. Okay? And this was never written in. Uh, it almost didn't need to be because the Supreme Court said that the Equal Protection Clause itself considers gender. Okay. All right, questions on that? All right, let's move on to the, um, the, uh, the Minor versus Haversett case. So now we're in 1875. I couldn't find a picture from... Oh, here she is, yeah. Okay, so this, this is Virginia uh, Minor, okay? So she was a suffragist, right? She wanted to vote. And uh, these, these women were very crafty, right? Susan B. Anthony did the same thing. Susan B. Anthony walked into a polling place and said, give me a, give me a ballot. And the guy says, this is probably not actually a true story, but this is the story, right? And the guy says, no, you can't vote. So Susan B. Anthony goes, here, look, Constitution, right? Take it out. She, I'm sure she had one in her pocket. It says, I don't know if I had pockets and dress, whatever, but she, I'm sure she had one, right? It says, nor denied to any person within its jurisdictions equal protection of the laws. 
doesn't say any men. It says any persons. She's like, I'm a person. Give me a ballot. And you know what? She got a ballot. And her, she lost. That was actually appealed all the way up. I think I don't know if the Supreme Court was appealed pretty high up. And she lost. They said, you can't vote. But before Susan B. Anthony, we had this other case. Not based on equal protection, but based on privileges or immunities. This is Virginia Louise Minor. She attempted to vote. And the Supreme Court held that voting was not a privilege or immunity of citizenship. Okay? Why was this not a privilege or immunity of citizenship? And here, the court further decimates the privileges or immunities clause. We already said that privileges or immunities refers to a certain federal civil rights, you know, like uh, the right to access the sub-treasuries. I'm saying this with scorn because they're stupid. Right? But the access to, ac access to navigable waters or protection of the high seas, really, really dumb rights that people don't care much about. This is why we fought a civil war. Right? So if you get lost in Mississippi, you can get, you know, the government will help you. Right? What they said here was that voting was not a civil right. It wasn't. Voting is what's called a political right. Now, what's the difference, you might ask, between a civil right and a political right? Okay? And the court said here that civil rights refer to those things that Justice Bushrod mentioned in Court v. Coriel and in the Civil Rights Act. The right to use and dispose property, the right to sell goods, the right to make contracts, the right to bear arms, these types of things. Okay? But a political right like voting, serving in office, is not covered by that. What the Supreme Court said was, the 14th Amendment does not limit the ability of people to vote. Okay? Privilege or immunity of citizenship is not a right to vote. And there are certain textual clues that this is probably correct even if you might not like the outcome. So first, let's look here, right? If the 14th Amendment guaranteed the right to vote to everyone, to all citizens, why would we need the 15th Amendment? If the 14th Amendment guaranteed the right to vote to everyone, blacks, whites, men, women, whatever. Why would Congress need to then ratify the 15th Amendment two years later? Everyone see that? If voting was a privilege or immunity of citizenship, why on earth would Congress need an additional amendment to give women the right to vote? Okay, so that's argument number one textually. Okay. Argument number two, the 15th Amendment only covers discrimination based on race or color. It says nothing about gender. If Congress wanted to give women the right to vote, they could have done so. They could have said, added like one word, right? Right? They could have done this. Should not be a bridge based on race, color, gender, or previous conditions. They could have done that. Add two words. But they didn't do that. Okay? Everyone with me so far. Third reason. Right? At the time of the founding, only one state allowed women to vote. It's actually New Jersey. Both states. If you were a single woman who owned property in the Garden State, you could pump your fist all the way to see a side and vote, right? <laughs> right? You could. I've actually done research on this. I'm trying to find if anyone, any woman from New Jersey, actually participated in the Constitutional Convention. I can't find anything about. I'm, I, I'm. They could vote, so I'm sure some of them went to the ratifying convention, but I, I can't find anything about this. I've been trying for years. Okay. But they said, listen, if every state in the country did not permit women to vote, how can it possibly be unconstitutional? In other words, if everyone who framed this amendment knew that women want to vote, right, 
The women's suffrage movement had been going on for years. Uh, it started in the 1840s and 1870s. Uh, this is this is actually the famous Declaration of Sentiments, which you might have had. Uh, uh, was by Elizabeth Cady Stanton at Seneca <laughs> Falls in 1848, which declared various rights for women. It was almost like a Declaration of Independence for women. It's, it's a very powerful document. You want to read it later. But everyone knew women had the right to vote. Not a single state permitted this. So the court said that not all citizens are voters. That you can limit the franchise based on a host of things. You can limit based on who owns property, education, gender. The only thing you can't limit it on is race, color, or servitude. I'm going to delete this so you don't get confused. Yeah, gender's not in there. <laughs> race, color, or servitude. Those are the only things that you can't limit the right to vote on. And voting is not a privilege or immunity of citizenship. Everyone's, everyone with me so far? Yes, sir. Race, what in servitude? Right here. Look, race, color, or previous condition of servitude. It's right there under the 15th Amendment. Yes? Why can they just justify this under the same sort of reasoning as, like, the slaughterhouse cases? Why did, because, I mean, in those cases, they were saying that the only privileges and immunities there are are these take the water and stuff. Why don't they just use the same reasoning here? Because they argued that it was a privilege or immunity of American citizenship to vote. Right? That that was one of the privileges and immunities of citizenship. Okay, so in, another, in other words, Slaughterhouse considered whether the Privileges or Immunities Clause to limit the state police power, right? The, 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 the minor case looked at the right to vote, which is something greater than the state police power. There's something that said no state can limit at all. That make sense? Yeah, so it's looking at more like the federal... Right, because a voting was a right of citizenship that could not be denied to anyone. And and in truth, the reason why they didn't mention the right to vote in Slaughterhouse was they thought it wasn't a right of citizenship. Yes, sir? Yes. Well, so so very, very good question. So um, I've actually researched this. So in, in, in nearly every state... If you're a convicted felon, you can no longer vote again. Some states will automatically grant them the right to vote when they get out of prison. Some states you have to petition the governor and ask for this. In other states, it's effectively impossible for a felon to ever vote again. The courts have upheld this, not really under the 15th Amendment, because servitude is not considered, um, uh, what do you call it? Ser going to jail might suck, but it's not considered servitude, right? The grounds on which the courts have upheld this is very shaky. Um, I, I don't, I don't think it's constitutional to divest some of their civil rights after they've gotten out of prison. Um, in fact, Senator Rand Paul and uh, who was it? One of the Democrats, remember who, introduced a bill recently that would grant felons the right to vote after they serve their time. Um, related issue is also the right to bear arms. If you are a felon, even a nonviolent felon, you can never own a gun again. For example, Martha Stewart can never own a gun own a gun legally, right? There's a great article, Why Can't Martha Stewart Own a Gun? Um, and it's a similar issue. It's like, how are you divested of your, free, uh, of your constitutional right after you serve your time? You know, could a, uh, does a person who went to jail lose their rights to free speech? No. Does a person who went to jail lose their rights against uh, reasonable searches and seizures? Yeah. You ever a probation officer? Okay. As a condition of getting out of prison, you have to give a probation officer permission to search your stuff whenever he wants. So you do waive certain rights. Uh, we talk about the sex offender, sex offender registry. If you are a sex offender, can you travel wherever you want and live wherever you want? No. You are indefinitely under the uh, thumb of the government, and you can only get permission to move, uh, and you have to tell someone about it. So the issue of, of former people in prison who give up constitutional rights is a very live issue, and the Supreme Court has upheld most of it under shaky reasoning, in my opinion. But that's just my opinion. Other questions? Let's see. All right. 
Anything else in this case? All right, let's go on to the last case, the Strouder case. Okay, this this is this is this is a a, 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 a it was eighteen eighty, so basically uh, about twelve years after the ratification of the Fourth Amendment. And this case actually takes a different. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Let me. I didn't. I didn't finish. The Nineteenth Amendment. This gave women the right to vote. It was only ratified in the year 1920, so roughly 50 years later, 40, 48 years, give or take. And it says the rights of citizens to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of sex. And Congress shall have the power to enforce this article by legislation. So it was not until 1920 that women got the right to vote. Now, what's interesting is that a lot of states had granted women the right to vote before this amendment. Uh, I think actually the first state to grant suffrage was Wyoming. And it's not because Wyoming was any kind of you know progressive bastion of freedom. It's because they wanted statehood. And if they had more women voting, they would have more citizens to submit to the union as having people, and they'd more likely become a state. But this happened a lot. A lot of the western states were among the first to grant uh, 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 women the right to vote because they can become states quicker. Uh, but by 1920, every woman now has the right to vote. Um, and then later, I wish to go to the number it is, was like the 25th Amendment, the right to, uh, I'm embarrassed to remember the number. Uh, yeah, uh, 24th Amendment. No, no, it's uh, 20, 26. Yeah, so now 18-year-olds can vote. This is the uh, the, the uh, college student provision to make sure all the college students can vote for Linda Johnson or whatever. Anyway, so we have that in the Constitution. Well, only partly facetious. All right. Any other questions about to Strouder? Okay. So Strouder versus West Virginia, right, considers the case not – the facts in your book are very sparse, but here's what happened. It wasn't uncommon. You're in West Virginia in the 1870s. A black man is accused of murder. He's tried by an all-white jury, and surprise of no one, he's convicted and sentenced to death. Okay, this was not this was not uncommon. Okay, uh, I don't know even the facts of the case; that they aren't in the opinion anywhere. But it's probably a fairly good guess that uh, this conviction was not done in a proper way. But we'll we'll leave that aside. So the issue here was that West Virginia had a law, okay? West Virginia had a law that said that um, only white men are able to sit on a jury. And Mr. Strouder challenged this law as a violation of the 14th Amendment. In particular, the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment. So by this time, everyone kind of realized that the Privileges or Immunities Clause was a dead letter. Let's stop trying to sue on that. Let's go seek the Equal Protection Clause of the Constitution. He says that people of color were singled out. Right? Now, just, just to stress, He's not arguing that he has the right to an all-black jury. He's not arguing that he has the right to even one black juror. All he's arguing is that the state can't disqualify people of color from the jury pool. So everyone knows how a jury selection works? So we know there's a grand jury and a petite jury, right? The grand jury is what's used to indict someone. This is where they get 20 or 30 people in a room, and the government presents the charges, and as long as everyone agrees that there's enough to go forward, a bill is issued and the, the person's indicted. Okay? That's a grand jury. A petite, or little in French, a little jury is usually 12. Not always 12, sometimes 8 or 10, but usually 12. Okay? And the way the jury is selected is that in the district where the crime occurs, the clerk of the court sends out notices to lots of people. You bring in a whole bunch of people to the court, and then the lawyer select jurors. Has anyone ever been to a jury selection or been, been jury duty? Did you get selected? I do not. You get selected? Yeah. Ah, tell us about it. Um, a very long day at first. Oh. Did they ask you any questions when they were selecting the jury? 
Yes. What'd they ask you? Um, well, they wanted people to go home, and I suspect that I was picked because the guy was about my age, and so they were trying to like rule out probably mm -hmm. people who would be never had sped in their lives. So, you know, they asked if you'd ever taken defensive driving. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Did you, Jury, also? Someone else? Yeah. One more hand? Okay, so generally the way it works is you have a list of possible jurors, right? And both sides, the defense and the prosecution, get to ask different questions. And they get to strike different jurors. So usually you have a certain number, you can always strike for cause. So say, for example, the juror knows the defendant, you can strike that person out. And say, for example, the juror has also been convicted of drunk driving, right? And so you can strike them out. But there's also something called a peremptory strike. Does anyone know what that is? A peremptory strike means you strike someone without any reason. You say, Your Honor, I don't want this juror. Poof, goodbye. Okay? These are usually limited. You usually have a certain number of these in any given trial. Okay. Why would a lawyer use a peremptory strike? Because maybe they don't trust the juror, but they don't have a reason. Okay. But what actually happened most of the time in, 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 in these jurors? The prosecutor would always use his peremptory strike against black jurors. Ah, so this would happen very frequently. Guess what year the Supreme Court found that peremptory strikes based on race were unconstitutional? Guess what year? No. Yeah, 80s. It was like 86 or so. Yeah, a case called Batson versus Kentucky. Uh, you'll say this in criminal procedure, I'm sure. But even after this case, it wasn't until the 1980s that the use of peremptory strikes based on uh, race was struck down. And I think, like, in 1992, in a case of Edmondson versus Concrete something, women, you can't use a peremptory strike to strike out women. And sexual orientation, like, four months ago, a court in California, Ninth Circuit said that you can't use a peremptory strike based on sexual orientation. This will go to the Supreme Court also. Okay? But that's today. Back then, the issue was whether you could have a statute that, that blanket excluded everyone who was a, 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 a black. Okay? What did the Supreme Court hold there? The Supreme Court said that that is unconstitutional, that that violates the protection of the laws. Okay? Why does it violate the protection of the laws? Because it effectively asserts that certain people are inferior under the law, that blacks cannot be trusted to sit on a jury, that it casts a stigma, a stigma upon them. Okay? The 14th Amendment doesn't allow... Uh, the state to discriminate based on color. Now this case is actually somewhat in tension with other cases we've studied later, like Plessy versus Ferguson, which held that the state could have separate facilities that created train cars. So why is this case different? Well, there are no separate juries, right? There's only one set of courts. And for, as far as access to courts go, you can't discriminate. The court also made another point, which I think I want you to reflect on for a moment. The notion that in order for a black man to have a fair trial, he needs to have access to black jurors. Now, I think in, in the South, it was pretty, in this time period at least, it was pretty easy to say that a black man with an all-white jury accused of murder was probably not going to get a fair trial. But the same rationale that only that you need to have some sort of diversity on a jury today in order for a person to get a fair trial is, is a tougher argument to make because it almost presumes that uh, people of a certain color will vote in a way to understand people of their own color better. Um, and that, that is a, it's a difficult conception, but it still pervades a lot of contemporary debates about diversity. Um, this actually happened in the Supreme Court last year. There was a judge in uh, New York who, whenever he would, uh, uh, you know, if a class action lawsuit, you approve counsel for the entire class, he would require that the, cl that the attorneys representing a, uh, uh, a class action had to be diverse, that he would require certain minorities on the uh, um, uh, council, because he said that way they can understand the clients better. And it's just reflecting this yourselves of whether minorities can better understand minorities, and so should the law countenance that. So I think that that, un that, that, that that undercurrents the court's opinion here. Okay? All right, so he struck it down. Questions on that? Yes, ma'am. My question is just in general about Peremptory, not preemptory. Peremptory. P E R E, peremptory. When they said that, when they 
what was it, 1980s and then Fleming Black came for sexual orientation. Do they get like one strike or how are they able to do it in such a way that they could discriminate for race or gender? Well, like say for example, there are six black jurors in the pool, right? right. And the prosecutor has six peremptory strikes. Do they get that many? I would just say if he has six, it varies. He uses all six and all six black jurors. That's a pretty good indication that he's using them in a discriminatory way. All right? right. So I mean, if say, say there say there are ten, say there are twenty prospective jurors, and he uses a peremptory strike against one black guy, that's probably not a problem. But if there are four black people in the room and he uses a peremptory strike against all of them, that's probably a bad problem. Yeah, I mean, if you ever do any kind of jury selection, you you, you always raise that, because even if you're wrong, at least you raised it and preserved the issue. Raise yeah, always object, St. Batson. That's all you have to remember, St. Batson, if you remember nothing else from this class. <laughs> Seriously, you, you, that that is one of the few things that can get a conviction overturned if you find a Batson violation. There are not many, but that's one of them. For example, if a judge permitted the use of peremptory strikes in a discriminatory fashion, that means the jury wasn't good, and that can actually overturn a conviction. Yes. So basically, um, this case, this case doesn't mean that um, states couldn't make it so African Americans and whites um, had to ride on different trains. It's just saying that because there's one jury. Yes. In other words, there is no separate jury, right? There's only one jury for convictions. Now, what's interesting is the court places a lot of limits. They say, well, but you can also restrict jury to men. Don't don't even think about putting a woman on a jury. Don't don't even go there, right? And, and, and don't even think about putting people perhaps who can't read on a jury. You know, maybe people don't own property in a jury. You just can't do it based on race. So the court limited a bit here. I don't think women were allowed to serve in the juries is actually interesting. Uh, I think the nineteen twenties that really became much more prominent. Because after the ratification of the Nineteenth Amendment. In other words, okay, so this is actually an interesting question, right? When the nineteenth amendment was ratified, here it is, in nineteen twenty. It said all women have the right to vote, right? Does it say that women have to be treated equally? No. So a lot of places continue to deny women access to sit on juries. And they argued that it only covers this. So there was this weird spot where, where women could vote but couldn't serve on a jury. Right? Right? Even, even, even more, one other weird oddity. Right? The Constitution speaks for the president being a, 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 a he, right? That he shall be a natural-born citizen. So the argument was actually made that a woman could vote for president, but couldn't become president herself, because she's not a he. There's all these weird linguistic things that went on for many years that didn't really resolve to the 70s. But even until the 19th Amendment, women could usually not serve on juries. That, that had to change more gradually. More questions? All right, so this was a lot. I, I know this was a lot, and I'll try to synthesize as much as I can. Um, the, the Reconstruction Amendments, 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments, were born out of a, uh, a crisis or a constitution of the Civil War. And you can look at these things in both a narrow and a broad sense. So the narrow sense first. In the narrow sense, all this was meant to do was to emancipate the slaves and to bring them into civil society. So all the 13th Amendment did was it said you can't have slavery. The 14th Amendment says you can't deny them certain federal rights, but you can still deprive them of any state rights. Right? And the 15th Amendment says, you know, they can vote now. That's a narrow sense. And that's the one the courts in this era took. But let's look at this in the much broader sense. Okay? In the broader sense, the 14th Amendment was about radically changing the relationship between the state and the federal government. That now, the states were not these sovereigns that we speak about in terms of the Article of Confederation. That, that the states were actually going to have to govern for these people. That the state police power, once viewed so broadly, now has significant limits on it based on these privileges or immunities of citizenship. That states could not discriminate based on race. That states cannot deprive people of various uh, of rights without giving them certain processes of law. Right? This is the broader vision of the 14th and 15th Amendments. But this vision effectively lost out by the court. The court struck with the narrow vision because they didn't want to disrupt the police power of the state. 
And as a direct result, perhaps, of the Supreme Court not actively enforcing the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments, we got the Black Codes. We got Jim Crow. We got the Ku Klux Klan riding through the South, lynching black people. Right? We had the resurrection of slavery by another name, Jim Crow. Once Reconstruction ended, the southern states effectively rebuilt whatever institutions that existed before. And it really wasn't until the 1960s that that came down. You know, we just had the 50th anniversary of the March on Washington. And, and, and it, it, it's striking how, how, how far we've come in, in nearly 50 years, although the flip side to that is if we haven't come far enough. So uh, in, in, in the broad arc of our, of our constitutional history, um, you have to remember, or keep in mind at least, what the framers of the Fourth Amendment were trying to achieve and what role the Supreme Court was willing to enforce those rights thwarted that. Because imagine slaughter has to come out the other way, right? Well, Solaris wasn't really about butchers. I mean, that was a good fact pattern. But it was not butchers. It was about the state violating the rights of the people. If slaughter has to come out the other way, the South could not have shut down newspapers, right? The South could not have locked people up without any process. The South could not have uh, held people for capture without any probable cause. They would now be bound by the federal constitution. And more importantly, they could seek remedies in federal courts. That was the other issue in Strouder. Strouder wants to remove his case or transfer his case from state court to federal court, right? And, and unsurprisingly, West Virginia said, no, we're not going to let you do that. And they could only do that because there were no federal issues at play. But if there were these federal rights at issue, federal courts, judges appointed by the president, could then be responsible for vindicating those rights. And we wouldn't get there until really the 1960s. One of the related notes tied back into the last class. Because the court said that's, that the 14th Amendment and Section 5 doesn't protect all these rights, the court turned to the Commerce Clause, right? That's what we have, cats and vacuum club. That's, that's Ollie's Barbecue. That's what we have, Hearts of Atlanta Motel. All these efforts to police segregation on the Commerce Clause for the very reason that the court said the 14th Amendment doesn't do anything for you. Now, a lot of people, myself partially included, think that the 14th Amendment was meant to protect against the types of discrimination, that you don't need to use the Commerce Clause, that... Uh, racial discrimination was such a horrible thing that the 14th Amendment allowed the regulation of private conduct when it was appropriate, right? But the court ignored that, that wish. So that's why we had to go to the Commerce Clause and expand it in the Civil Rights era. Right? <sighs> Questions? Anything else? Yes, sir. Ah, well, that was what the McDonald case was, the Second Amendment case I mentioned. In McDonald in 2010, the court was asked to don't reverse all these cases, just say that slaughterhouse was wrong and the right to bear arms is one of the privileges or immunity to citizenship. And the court said, no, nah, we're not going to do it. Let's maintain the status quo. Why rock the boat? It's a case I was very sad with. Other questions? All right. Yes, ma'am. When you were talking about the substantive component of process, uh, could you? I'm going to do this. I'm going to spend like a month on that. So okay. we'll come back to that later. Just, just, just FYI. Anyone else? Have a great day, everyone.